hey, it never said that before. What do you know? Um, <laughs> that was weird. Okay, so we're going to do the solar uh, noon Tuesday. Let's see, it's, it's the 25th of May. And uh, I wanted to touch base. I know Tony's on here. He was um, on the install this weekend. I just thought I would um, raise a couple of um, reminders to me anyway from the install that we just did. We did a, it was sort of a ground mounted system, but not really um, over the weekend uh, as part of a class. It was a pavilion that had been purpose built to hold the array. So it was technically a roof mounted system, but it wasn't really. Uh, it was a, like a pergola kind of thing that we mounted onto it. And I think everything went pretty smoothly. We used end phase microinverters. We used the end phase um, combiner box. And we did that with the idea that we might expand the array by three times its current size on three different sections of the roof. He has a south facing portion of the roof that we could do, and he has a west facing portion. And then we have the pergola that we put 10, 10 panels on. Um, and then also we have the option of adding batteries through the end phase combiner box later. Uh, one of the real advantages for us was during the install, one of the students in the class was a licensed electrician. So he took care of most of the electrical permitting process for this build. Um, but there were a couple of things that came up that I think are worth remembering. Uh, of course, one is we, we did a check on all of the materials when they arrived, but uh, that check never, those checks never are a hundred percent. And what we ran into was um, we ordered the end phase um, or the Iron Ridge XR1000 rails, the lighter duty rails uh, for this rooftop thing. Well, when we got, when we opened up the splice kits, they were for the XR100. And so they don't fit inside of the XR1000. They're just slightly, slightly bigger, although visually they look the same. And the same thing for the end caps. Those were for the XR100, but for whatever reason, the distributor gave us the XR100 instead of the XR1000. Um, so of course, neither the splice kits or the end caps were gonna fit. The end caps wasn't a big hairy deal, but we couldn't continue on until we had spliced the rails together and um, so we sent some guy, one of the guys off to buy some, uh, some bonding straps so that we could do the bonding on this. Um, and he could not find them anywhere. We tried auto parts places, we tried uh, hardware stores, we tried everything and apparently no one sells bonding straps. So what we ended up doing is cutting some aluminum bus bars. And um, then we uh, used those as bonding straps because we, we had to have something that was made of aluminum. Uh, so, so we just used those and bonded the rails together and that seemed to work. So we jury rigged that, but that took us, you know, a good half hour of using the angle iron uh, to grind these things down and get them all organized. And uh, what were some of the other issues? So, you know, you always end up, I guess on any build, after you've done this a while, you know that you gotta have somebody who's there just to run to the hardware store periodically to get stuff because it doesn't matter how much stuff you have. It's never the right stuff when you go to make your connections. Um, we ran into a problem with the, we had bought an AC disconnect, but it didn't have the proper connection step down for the pipe that goes from the AC disconnect to the uh, end phase combiner box. So that took a, a wee little bit of time. Um, 
the electrician was telling me a couple of things that were kind of new to me, even though I know one of them was in the book, but sizing of the equipment ground wires. I've always just used the attitude that whatever the diameter of the wire is prior in the circuit gives you an adequate ground, equipment ground, which is true, but it turns out, of course, you don't have to go that big. And so, so that was kind of something to remember anyway. So for instance, we were running a um, 10 microinverters. So these were the IQ7 pluses. So they generate 1.21 amps for each one. So we put 10 in a, in a parallel branch circuit. So we're really just going a little over 12. Of course, for the sizing of the wire, you got to multiply that times 1.25 uh, for the safety on the wire. So we were a little over 15 amps. So clearly um, a, a 12 gauge wire would have worked, which is 20 amps. But we went ahead with a, um, I think he pulled eight gauge wire there. So it was really overkill. We could have gone 10 quite easily and it might've been 10 there, um, but I think it was eight for some reason. Um, the home and, run? Pardon? Oh. Was that the home run from the microinverters to the panels? It was from the, uh, no, it was from the junction box where we connected the end phase cable to you know, transition that wire because it's a proprietary cable to the combiner box. So that was about 60 feet or so. So, so voltage drop wasn't really an issue. Um, I think we we're just trying to overkill it. And I think he had a couple of rolls of, of that wire size there. And, uh, but then from the combiner box to the circuit breaker box, we, we went ahead and ran six gauge wire because the um, maximum ampacity of that combiner box is 80 amps. So we wanted to max it out, you know, without doing any wire changing at all. So if we tripled the size of the array, it would still be fine between the connection point between the combiner box and, and the breaker. Uh, so, so the six gauge goes to 80 amps, if I remember right, maybe a little bit more. Um, Another thing that was interesting is the CT sensors that go with this combiner box. Um, and I know Bob has installed these. Have any of you guys used the Enphase combiner box? John, didn't you do that with yours, a combiner box unit from Enphase? Um, are you talking the one on the house or the combiner that, that's out by the panels? On the house, the where you yeah. home run in. Yeah, and, and that CT ring that'll do the um, revenue grade uh, monitoring. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, and it has the Envoy system, the communication system within the, the combiner box. Uh, and Correct. that's kind of a slick, nice little system. Um, but the uh, electrician was telling me, he, he called me up actually uh, on Sunday because we hadn't quite finished commissioning the system partly because Tim, the homeowner, hadn't actually got his formal permit from the city yet. So we went ahead and did the install just because everybody was lined up, hoping that they're not going to come back and say, how dare you do that, take it all apart, you know. So, so he didn't commission it yet, but the electrician came out, John did, and, and uh, um, hooked up the CTs. Uh, but then he wanted to know where they landed on the combiner box. And I had the instructions with me. And I told him, I said, well, just wait until I show up. I can, you know, show you the diagram and we can do it. And he was saying, listen, these things are real dangerous if they're not connected, which kind of struck me as interesting because they just look like little sensor wires to me. I don't quite, but he seemed to indicate it was a life and limb kind of thing if he didn't terminate those. So, so I'll need to look into that a little bit further, but I, I, that was surprised to me. Um, another thing. Already, in, yeah. Yeah. I, remember, I can't remember. I thought mine were already connected, but. 
There is yeah, one already in there, but if you run them to the mains on your service panel for oh, your- There's no auxiliary set, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we installed those, yeah, Bob? Are we talking about the, the coils that uh, you pass the wires through? Yeah, you just the little rings that go over the mm -hmm. their sensors of they're called CTs. Um, I can't imagine it being life threatening. Yeah, because it was like twenty gauge wire. It's not it's not huge, so clearly it can't be running a lot of amp. Could run a lot of volts. I don't know, but uh, and and he could just be overly cautious I don't I don't know on that either um, but but that was interesting to me and another thing that he did and I still have to look it up in the code book because I'm not a hundred percent sure one of the things that um, you know is in the code is if you're using wire smaller than six gauge you can color code it by wrapping tape uh, near the termination points with the appropriate color but he did a looped pull for the two hots coming from the array where he just doubled the size of the red wire and then pulled it from the midpoint all the way through and used two reds as the hots from the combiner box to the junction box at the array. And we we're pulling smaller than, than um, six gauge wire and I told him, I don't think we can do that. I think it has to be a black and a red. Um, and he said, no, in the code, because these are the two hots, those can be indicated with the color, even though they're less than six gauge. Um, because the code says the code color coding is red, black, or any other color. Um, and I need to double check that. I, I don't dis, I don't disbelieve him, but I've just, I haven't seen that um, in my reading, but I was never really looking for it. So I don't know, Siggy, have you ever run across that at all? Um, uh, with two, two hots in AC? At most black usually. Um, well, there's usually a black and a red for the 240, um, you know. Uh, well, the red is usually the, the switch leg, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's how I would, uh, what I would assume if I see a red wire is I would think that's the switch leg, but I could be wrong. Well, um, with 240 AC, often it's a red and a black, and one's just line one and one's line two. Yeah. Um, so that's very, very common, um, but, but I've not seen two reds before, but then we just marked it with black tape. No. So who knows if the electrical inspector passes it, I, I suspect that's all that matters. But yeah. um, anyway, and it's kind of interesting to see when you've got an electrician who works in a city, an electrical inspector who comes, they just kind of talk to each other and go, everything cool, John? Yeah, okay, well, all right, I'll see you later, you know. <laughs> and, and there's not a whole lot of inspection going on. So, so what's the definition of an, an approved electrician? Somebody who they like. <laughs> I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he was a trip. I know um, that John is a, he's a character. He's, he's, a, he's a throwback to uh, Haight-Ashbury district kind of thing, so. Was, well, you had to, you had to de de educate me on all the stuff my grandfather taught me. <laughs> <laughs> well, our grandfathers were usually right and often wrong, but you know, often never never in doubt. So <laughs> that's exactly. that's the way we always say: frequently wrong, but never in doubt. So. All right. Um, anybody have any any issues to raise before? Yeah, Bill, you got some. You're still muted. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I got it. I'm going to share my screen. I got an email this morning from University of Houston, which is generally a pro oil and gas, and I'll just bring it up. Oh, yeah. It's about the hydrogen economy. They're beginning to offer um, uh, training in that area, you know, in anticipation that maybe the hydrogen economy will <clears throat> happen. And uh, I, I just thought it was interesting. Uh, 
and not only that, I might mention I read uh, in the Chronic Houston, or maybe it was Bloomberg, <laughs> uh, that uh, an outfit is going to put in a uh, repurpose of wind turbine to generate 60 metric tons per day of hydrogen for um, uh, for anticipated demand increases in hydrogen. I'm just throwing that out, FYI. I'm just, it's kind of curious. I might add that University of Houston is, up until a few years ago, is sponsored speakers who denied global warming and, <clears throat> and they're heavily supported by local oil and gas companies. So, yep. you know, this may yeah. be, uh, you know, this is a, a way in my mind for the oil and gas. The oil and gas. To stay in the to game, stay in right? the game right? yeah yeah yep uh yeah. well i think you're right in that often hydrogen in most uh fuel cells applications has been generated by uh natural gas not through electrolysis um that that they like to talk it talk it, about it because i think if i remember right the chemical equation of uh Methane, methane gas is, is it C6H6? Something like that. <laughs> anyway, remember. so the hydrogen is generated from the methane. And uh, of course, the, uh, the off gas is carbon, carbon dioxide um, or carbon monoxide and, uh, you know, a greenhouse gas. So, so it's a pretend green technology when used in that way. But there has been a lot of discussion. Um, they're worried about once you have a certain level of, um, of penetration with solar and wind, the grid can only accept power from the wind, especially when, the, um, when there's a load demand. So what do you do when you have excess uh, production but not demand? And Texas is really ripe for this because you guys are not interconnected with the rest of the world. So you can't just ship it off to California or to, uh, to New York. So they're saying, well, we can create hydrogen. And that hydrogen is basically a storage capacity. Um, and they can do that through electrolysis. And that's the argument. My, my thought on it, though, is hydrogen storage is, is very difficult. Um, it's such a small molecule that it must be cryogenically frozen and compressed. Otherwise, it just leaks through the metal containers. Um, so battery technology typically is a more rapidly advancing and a more cost-effective way of storing that excess energy. But they're worried about having to curtail, you know, turn off the wind turbines and turn off the solar panels when there is abundant energy available. So we need storage and hydrogen is one of those where they can chase government money and keep using. Um, it, it's a technology they understand because it's a supply chain thing. I can control the fuel. Even if it's hydrogen versus natural gas, you're still controlling the fuel, you're shipping it through pipelines. You know, it's, it's something that's familiar to them in their business model. Yeah, Bob. Did you get that article I sent you about uh, the so solar panel uh, manufacturing? That yeah, I saw a... that. I saw that. That was interesting. It was like basically a, a non-toxic methodology of, of perovskite manufacturing. So there's a new a new technology out there that you were. It was like carbon-based perovskite. Is that what they were calling it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was interesting. And I know Don sent me an article about the Ford Lightning, which um, is a pretty cool tech. Uh, it's, it's basically the new Ford F-150 uh, all electric. And, um, and they're setting it up not only to have um, seven electrical outlets on the vehicle, so it's basically a contractor's vehicle. You can use the electric as a portable generator. Um, and, and I thought, I, first I thought it was a misprint, but they kept referring to the frunk, you know, instead of the trunk. And they're talking about the, the hood where the engine normally is, there's no engine. 
So they've got like a place in there where they've got outlets and, you know, plugs and cargo and all this other stuff because there is no motor. Um, or, well, there's no engine, there are motors, but they're attached to the wheels. Um, I think I think the big thing on that vehicle, though, is it's going to macho um, electric vehicles. It's going to take it into the, you know, hairy, hairy chest world of, of uh, electric vehicles, you know, and uh, and that's good. I mean, once once they become macho, then suddenly, you know, the men purchase them. And that was really the downside of the original electric car is back in the early 1900s, electric vehicles were the predominant technology, but they marketed themselves as easy to start, quiet to run, the perfect vehicle for the ladies. You know, that was their marketing, but it was the men who bought the cars. And the other ones were like, this is, this will go fast. It's loud. It does, you know, you could work on it yourself, that kind of stuff. So they're like, oh, 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 oh. you know, so that's why they want. Yeah. So, yeah, Bob. I have an answer to that. I'm, I'm coming up with electronic sound generators. You can have a 350 iron block with a dual exhaust or, <laughs> and you just hook it up to your electric cars and Sure. You think it'll, you can turn it to it? You could do Ferrari, Porsche. It'll be like you know. ringtones, right? Ringtones exactly. for your car. <laughs> I think I'm joking. Wait till you see what no. happens. No, you yeah. know, it's interesting because they did that with, um, they have electric motorcycle races um, where these things go real fast. And one of the problems was they didn't make the kind of noise that the crowd liked. So they had to outfit them with these little noisemakers as they went around the tracks going, making all that, you know, I'm sure that's yeah. not how they sound. But uh, anyway, well, they know. were, uh, <laughs> they had to make them noisy and macho and, you know. All they could just stuff. stick uh, baseball cards in the spokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're back to the to the Prius. Who's that Jeff Dunham talking about the Prius going by going, I'm gay, you know, so. That was. I I actually drove the uh, new uh, VW ID4. Uh -huh. uh, my partner here got uh, the first one delivered to Lakeland. And uh, well, I what, one thing I never really realized was, um, you know, in Florida, you usually, and no matter where you park, no matter where you wait, you have the engine running because you have to have the air conditioning on. Right. And with the ID4, of course, it was probably it was all electric cars. It's just so nice because it's completely quiet and you can sit as long as you want and the air conditioner is always running and there's no engine. Uh-huh. Well, speaking, awesome. of, speaking of that, when I looked at the, the article that Don had sent regarding the uh, Ford Lightning, um, one of the things they did mention other than, oh yeah, the, the generators for the job site but they do, they were marketing that their plug-in uh, connection was a bi-directional whole house. Um, so you could use your car to run your house if the grid goes out. Clearly, they failed to mention you'd probably have to have a couple thousand dollars in critical load panels and things like that installed to, uh, to do that. But, but that's kind of when we've been talking about the bi-directional ports for um, for charging, but they did also point out that you can get a 45 mile range boost with like 10 minute charging. So, for instance, if you go to a to a gas station or whatever where there's electric charging and you don't want to spend you know an hour or more, uh, you can at least get home um, if you're running low. And then they also said they, they had it in basically the two tiers, like four or 50 miles in 10 minutes, but also um, you can go to 80%. And I'm going by memory here, Don. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a short period, like an hour or something like it that. Was, it was like 50 minutes, I think. And I, yeah. But I, I did think the other part was they mentioned on the bi-directional. They, they just kind of said it in passing, but they said something effective. By the way, you'll have to have a four to a Ford uh, uh, charger station set up in your house for all this to work properly. Right, and they said, we'll help you with it. You we'll know. help you install, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in other words, yeah. they'll get a fee for referring some electrician to go in there and install it for you. 
because more yeah. likely than not. <laughs> yep, John's saying that's that's me. So um, <laughs> yeah, they, and it makes sense. I mean, it's 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 a it's a job, but it's definitely it it really is kind of I think a harbinger of things to come. Uh, once again, why pay for the batteries when you could drive them? You know, so so using your electric vehicle as your battery backup system for your home um, makes perfect sense. Okay, any other issues before I go on to the um, to the Energy Sage report? I did have okay. one, and I, yeah. it, this is covered uh, in an earlier session. I apologize, and we we can maybe discuss it offline. Um, but with my ground mount system, especially in, in a relatively wooded area where I am, I've noticed just how much of an affinity the birds have to perching themselves on the top. And uh, of course, they, they do their business there too um, and, and leave a bit of a mess. And I'm wondering, uh, I've seen bird spikes, but I've also seen references to the potential to damage the panel and, and disturb the warranty and so forth. Uh, there's filament. You know, putting filament across the top that might discourage birds. I, I guess I'm curious if there are any ideas that seem to work well, don't look too obtrusive, and last a while, are UV tolerant, and so forth. Yeah, I've um, never heard of that. I mean, what comes to mind is the the dreaded owl. You know, put an owl, fake owl there, but they usually figure that out pretty quick. Um, that that owl yeah. never seems to move and is made of plastic. You know, so. Well. Um, um, I'm a sailor and uh, what I notice is we have that problem uh, with the boats and the docks and uh, the uh, what seems to be popular is uh, having a, a sprinkler system come on. I'm not quite sure if, what, what triggers it, but it comes on and sprinkles over the boats or over the dock and I guess birds don't like it too much. Huh. And unfortunately, of course, the water is my yeah. well water, which has a lot of minerals. So yeah. yeah it's, That's it's pretty <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know what you're, because if you try and put filament, even though it casts very little shadow, it casts some. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe well, giving them an alternative, an alternative perch. Um, I don't know if that would make any difference. You know, a lot of times with animals, if you give them what they would prefer to keep them away yeah. from where you don't want them to be, uh, that might be an option. Uh, we, we, we haven't had a lot of problems except when the starlings come through in their big mobs mm -hmm. and, yeah. and then they just come and, and that's when I usually have to wash the panels because, because they just, they just cover it with all of their, um, their, their calling card. But as, fortunately we don't have a lot of those, uh, purple poke berries or something right next to it. Cause we used to have that happen down, uh, you know, oh, where they, they do. They do have a, a product for cats, which uh, keep them off of uh, kitchen counters and stuff like that. And I bought one of these things and uh, I think they're visual sensitive to it. And they give out a crack, like something breaking, a very sharp noise. And I watched my cat, I bought it. I watched my cat go up on the counter. This thing went off. It jumped about three feet in the air and the ceiling was two feet in the air. Hmm. And it does the job. It gets... Is it like a motion actually, sensor or something? I, I think so. Uh, so you just lay it on the counter. And uh, at, at Petiti Garden Center, they always had uh, like a timed thing that let off like a kind of a falcon screech every 10 minutes or so. Your neighbors um, would love that, John. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there, I believe there's also some kind of uh, like ultrasonic kind of sound that it can emit that you old folks might not pick up. But, uh, you know, there's a few, <laughs> there's a few other options. Yeah, of course, I yeah. want the bluebirds and other, other birds in the area. But yeah, the robins and actually like a week after I installed them, I had a turkey vulture perch himself on top of my panels. And uh, no, I wasn't going to mess with him. He, he can sit wherever he wants. Are they sitting uh, right at the very top? Is that the place? Yeah, right at, right at the absolute top. And invariably, they face away from the panel. So when they do their business, they, they drop it right on them. Just right there, yeah. I wonder if you and couldn't put some little seeing eye sensor type thing, one at one corner, one at the other, that when they break the contact, 
it makes a noise or it it does something um, you know that would would cause them to startle. Of course, they'll probably relieve themselves as soon as they startle, and uh, yeah. that doesn't do you much good. I know my my uncle always told the story when they built a, a golf course up in Colorado, up in the mountains, and they were having elk come and they would uh, eat the greens. You know, they would come onto the green and their their hoofs would, you know, cause damage. So they put these little timed shotgun shell things to go off like every half hour at night mm. to startle the elk away and they came back mm. the next day and it looked like the greens had all been rototilled because apparently what the elk would come and they'd be grazing it would go off and they just startle and and tear up as they left and just about the time wow. they calmed down and came back to start grazing again the, the shell would go off again and they just ripped the crap out of every single green in the golf course. So, so wow. sometimes the solution is worse than the problem. It seems yeah. like if you just shot one elk and left it there, the others would get the hint. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, only, it only works with humans. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You should just issue a fine, issue a warning. <laughs> no elk allowed. Put a sign, yeah, no, no elk allowed. So. Yeah. All right. A little experiment and have to report back. Okay. Yeah, that'll be interesting because I've really not heard that as an issue. Apparently, you're the only bird hater uh, that's ever installed solar. So everybody else is trying to. I'm a bird attract. hater. I'm a bird poop hater. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. A subtle yet important distinction. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay. Um, let me let me go over quick the um, Energy Sage report, which I found was interesting. And if you do a search on, on Google and you want to see, it's called the uh, Energy Sage Marketplace Intel Report. They do these things periodically. But I just got the highlights from this. Um, according to theirs, the, um, the median price for solar install in the U.S., all in, pre-incentive, is $2.75 a watt. Um, the mode is 250, so the most common price, 250. Um, the high quote areas, Colorado, with an average of $3.15. New York was in second place with $3.10. And Illinois in third place with $3.05. So uh, a fair bit above the national average. Um, the storage, of course, has gotten to be a big deal. And um, I had told you guys before, there, the research is showing one in five systems now involve storage that at the residential level being installed. And even the one we did over the weekend, we installed it with the idea that storage could be added in the future. So we didn't install the uh, storage now. Although in speaking with Tim, he was saying, well, why didn't I go ahead and install the storage? And I'm like, I don't know, why didn't you? But um, because he can still get the tax incentives, you know, this year. So he may still decide to add that in this year. Um, we'll see. Do you think what happened uh, with Continental is getting people to rethink it as a, as a more serious backup option? Because I didn't consider it because, yeah, very expensive. And in this area, we're 99 plus percent reliable, yeah. but there's the, uh, the X factor as it were. Yeah, of, and I uh, think what, what you'll probably see and what I recommend to a lot of folks is put the smallest battery, back, battery bank that you can buy in there because mm -hmm. really, you know, you can, as long as you've got battery of any size, then you can use your array when the sun is shining. So if you have a protect, protracted, power outage, you know, you can recharge your refrigerators, your freezers during the day, you know, let's say you've got a two week outage because Hurricane Katrina comes through or whatever, you know, at least you got some power instead of, you don't have to invest a, a great deal. Um, so that's an option, but of the reasons for putting in power, number one is backup power, as, as we're talking about, 69% of the people said that. Savings on the utility rate, that was 51. So that would have been time of day, 
uh, pricing where they can do some load shifting. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously marketplaces where that's an issue, that was the big issue. Um, Self-supply, and that's a confusing term, but basically it's again, kind of um, time of day pricing where let's use our power when we can rather than send it back to the utility when they're not gonna pay us very much for it. So I'd rather store that power than send it back to the utility. Um, setting it up with a battery later, 31% of the systems. So that's no battery at the moment. And of course, only 15% of the people who responded were completely off grid, you know, as far as putting batteries in. So that, that in itself, if you figure battery-based systems, only 15% of those installed are off grid. You know, it's a subset of a subset. Of the batteries that are being installed, LG Chem made up 40% of the market. Um, Tesla was 34% of the market. Uh, Enphase was 13% of the market. Panasonic, 5%. Generac was 3%. And then everything else was another 5%. So clearly LG Chem, Tesla, and Enphase, the, the vast bulk of the market. And I'm sure the Enphase is only for those people who have microinverters, because that's what it's compatible with. Yeah, Jake. Um, of interest to me on this, if, if you're doing a, a load shifting or something where you're truly anticipating using the up and down of the charge state of the batteries every day, uh, the number of charge cycles before you start seeing deterioration is not trivial at that point. Are there algorithms for calculating the cost to your aggregate system in five years or something that factors in the deterioration of the batteries? I haven't seen any, but you bring up a really good point because the more you cycle these things, um, you know, the faster they're going to wear out. So um, uh, I don't know. That would be an interesting financial analysis to make. Um, I think it's still young enough that people haven't delved that deeply into, you know, they kind of go, hey, it's going to do this thing I want it to do without really anticipating that issue. Um, yeah. And I guess, uh, sorry, Bob, let me finish that one. Is it, the question I have is, is the deterioration real? Is it documented that this really happens or is that just a protection for companies selling their products because they don't know quite what's going to happen? Well, you know, it's real, but, but most of this comes from the world of uh, lead acid batteries. So I don't know if the cycle rate affects lithium ion batteries in the same way. Um, you know, with lead acid, the more you cycle them, the faster they wear out. But because of the sulfation issue, um, you know, you, you had to deal with shallow depth of discharge and things like that. But with lithium ion, depth of discharge makes no difference. Um, Non-fully charging them seems to make no difference. At least that's what the literature says. Um, have you seen anything, Siggy, about lithium ion as far as cycling, how many cycles, if that affects the longevity of a lithium ion battery? Because I've not seen any articles myself talking about that particular thing. Um, and they're supposed to have about a 10-year life cycle uh, for lithium yeah, ion. What I have in mind about a 10-year or longer life cycle. Um, apparently, I mean, uh, what I know about lithium, you can go all the way down to, to uh, what they're rated for. That's a big advantage um, because, you know, with the traditional... Uh, that acid batteries, you really can only use about half the capacity if you want to get a decent cycle life out of this, which is maybe, I would have to guess right now, but, but usually it's somewhere between two and 4,000 cycles you get out of a traditional battery. Um, I don't know, I would think, I, I would think on 10, 10 years, how many cycles is it? I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, one thing that uh, just occurred to me, though, Jay, is that um, these things are warrantied based on years. So, so, you know, 10 years warranty, and if it goes bad, it goes bad. You know, you get it replaced uh, under warranty. So maybe it's a non-issue whether you cycle it, you know, 
365 times a year or four times a year, the warranty is going to expire at the end of 10 years. So, um, so that might not be an issue. Uh, of so, the pricing, uh, of the pricing uh, on these, Tesla and Generac are the cheapest and the most expensive is Enphase. Yeah, Bob, you had something? Well, two things. Uh, first of all, I'll research that and report next meeting on that. Okay. On the cycle segregation. And uh, for my usual fees, <laughs> charge. Also, on, on the Enphase combiner box, I do see the input for the batteries, but I don't understand what it's for. I mean, is it an output? Is it an input or? It's both. It's both an output and input, but it's got to go through another, um, it's got to go through another module that has the inverters um, as part of that because it's an inverter charger kind of situation. Um, but that's the connection point in the combiner. So I think you take the batteries, that's one integrated package with the inverters. And then it's also got to go through a transfer switch and then it connects in. You know, so, so there's two other components that have to be added to that before you can use batteries. Because um, you've got to disconnect from the grid uh, before you can uh, use your batteries. There was a thing about, oh, no, I don't have that. All right. Um, yeah, I need to understand a little bit more about that end phase combiner. I think we'll get some information. One question I had there, and maybe someone who's used it is familiar, um, or maybe you didn't get into this. Because we didn't commission the system, so I never went through discovery on the end phase combiner. Um, you know, you've got to sync up your your mobile phone with the communication device and then you do a discovery of all the devices and then you map the devices and you start to try and get it communicating with Enphase. We didn't do that yet. So my question is, are the microinverters producing even though they have not yet been discovered by the system? Yes, because with the old Envase, Envoy system, those two were completely separate issues. You know, they, you hook they, up, you hook up the hardware, but then you hook up the communication issue. But because right. this all comes through one unit, I wonder if they've got like a fail safe where they're simply not going to produce until they're discovered. No, the the, uh, the envoy is in the combiner, and it, it's just a regular envoy without housing. Um, right. The uh, uh, so I have a separate Envoy in a separate box that I installed on my Enphase. And when I first installed the Enphase, I didn't pair it up with the, uh, with the internet yet. But uh, I had the system on and I put a clamp on meter on and it was producing what it was supposed to be producing. Okay. Yeah, because I, I... I had the same experience with mine. Even though I didn't have the communication set up at all, when I first turned it on, uh, I had my amp probe on there and it was producing... And also, uh, it, it was uh, turning the meter backwards at that yeah. point. Well, Tim uh, Tim Chavez, where we installed the system, he had called me and wanted to know how he could check. And I told him, you know, there's a little LED light up on the microinverter. And if it's red, there's a problem. If it's amber, it's connected, but it's not communicating with the grid. And if it's green, you're golden, it's producing, but he couldn't mm. find any lights. So it could just be he couldn't find the lights um, or it could be that they're sitting there dark. I don't, I don't know, but they're kind of hard to see anyway. Yeah. They're yeah. very, they very faint. And you only have three inches of crawl underneath the panels to look up at them. I know that's the problem, um, but you should be able, I told him go out after dark and peer in the side the, the little indicator lights on the side where the cables connect. So said, look in it at the side there, you should be able to see something in the dark. Yeah, after flashing. dark, what's gonna, be, what's gonna be generating the power to have the lights on? Well, it should still indicate that it's connected to the grid. You yes. know, I, I, okay. I think it would still, 
it would still give you the green. I mean, I, I must admit, little, I've not gone out to check mine. Um, it's got a little battery that, or it's got something coming back from the grid to power it. I mean, it's a yeah, light. It's yeah, the, it, the inverter has to have a, a signal connection. You know, that's as part of the rapid shutdown. So it's got some sort of sensor to the grid clearly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would never know to shut down when the grid goes off. Um, but one thing that did indicate that it looks like things are good is the, uh, is the surge suppressor was showing him the little blue light, you know, the little LED up there. So we put in a midnight solar surge suppressor on the junction box. So that's telling me that it is physically connected through. Um, I always look at mine just to make sure everything's happy when I go out there at night. So I may be deluding myself, but at least uh, tells me all's good. Um, oh, uh, the other thing from the, um, from the report, the inverters, and I found this very interesting for residential, um, the market share of inverters, 50% in the fourth quarter of last year are end phase. So clearly micro inverters are, are booming. 40% um, solar edge. So between end phase and solar edge, they've got 90% of, the, um, of the market. And then sun power, which I wasn't even that familiar with as a string inverter is 4%. SMA was 3%. And then all others were another 3%. So, so we're in residential, we're in the world of micro inverters and, and power optimizers to be sure. Um, so to me, so those trend, were the highlights. What's the trend on those ratios? Is it, um, are, are, is that other end phase or um, solar edge gaining over the past few years or does it just? Yeah, I think um, end phase has gained in the last year over solar edge. Up until 2020, um, Solar Edge was was making progress and and was actually the number one choice. Um, yeah, I thought and, they were. That's yeah, and there were a lot of reasons for that, but primarily when I spoke to installers, they didn't like the reliability of Enphase. You know, they had a lot of the microinverters that were going bad. Um, so I think maybe the IQ sevens um, fix that, or the IQ seven plus. So reliability is probably an issue. Customer service was another issue. They felt that Enphase had poor customer service and Solar Edge had good customer service. But I think Solar Edge has gotten just as bad as Enphase was. So, so I don't think customer service is an advantage anymore. I don't think either of them improved, but uh, um, mm -hmm. so, so that's not a thing now. And the other thing was uh, future storage ability. So I think when Enphase came up with their battery system and the uh, combiner box, and those are relatively new uh, innovations. I think they came out in the beginning of 2020. Um, that was a big deal. So that you could, you felt like it was now future-proofed a bit and you could go ahead and go with microinverters where before I would have recommended Solar Edge just because of the storage capability where you could go with a battery in the future because you couldn't do that with microinverters up until this plug and play thing. Yeah, Bill? Uh, I need to uh, replace some uh, microinverters going bad. Has anyone had any experience with dealing with in phase at this point? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I posted a video on our webpage um, on, on solar training, solarpvtraining.com, and it'll walk you through the entire process. Um, but it was pretty seamless. I thought it was, um, if you go into your enlightened monitoring uh, software, right at the top of the page, there's a little button that says like report an issue or report a device issue or something. You click there and it'll ask you to, to identify which one is the problem. And then they'll do a verification just to make sure that it is in fact gone bad. Um, but then it was pretty seamless, pretty straightforward. They shipped me one in the mail. I replaced it. Uh, they had sent um, a postage paid uh, um, label that I put the old one in the box and slapped it on and sent it back. And 
And they sent me a brand new uh, IQ um, inverter to replace my old M215. So I'm kind of hoping that the rest of them go bad before their warranty <laughs> goes out. How old uh, was your inverter that you replaced? It was, I had bought it um, as a remainder. So it was already like four years um, old and the warranty starts the day of manufacturing. Um, so, so I think it was probably six or seven years old um, by the time it went out. But it was the M215, you know, and, and in the life of these inverters, I think the very first one was the M175, and then it went to the 195s, then the 215s, 250s, and then they started the IQ6 and the IQ7 and the IQ7+. Plus. Now I think they've got the IQ8, which is like a two panels connected to the same inverter or something. Um, and so they have also an X, um, but what is the length of time that they are warranted for? I thought it was three years. No, 25 years. 25, yeah. yeah, they're 25 year warranty. And, and what's nice is they weren't, uh, there was no registration process for the warranty. It's all based on their, no, um, on their number. So, so like you don't have to, you know, make sure your paperwork was in order kind of stuff. That was, that was real sweet. I, I give them an A plus for how they dealt with the replacement thing. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I really expected problems. That's one reason I documented it from the very beginning. Cause I was ready to do a, a YouTube video that slammed in phase, you know, and uh, showed all the hassles we had to go through. <laughs> but it was it was clean and easy. Of course, ours is a ground mounted system, so it was also very easy to replace it. Whereas with a rooftop system, you know, it would have been a pain in the butt to pull the panel. And I mean, I never even had to pull the panel. I just, you know, popped it off of there and and stuck the new one on. I always thought the one that was in the middle of the array was the first one to go back. Yeah, and this one was, but the fact that it was on the bottom, you know, I could access it from the bottom, that was cool. And, and actually what I found is the new inverter, that panel now produces about 10 watts more than all of the other panels consistently. So the inverters, the new inverters made a difference. Uh, even though they were one, um, or 225 or 215 limit. Um, now this panel, I, I'd say the new one generates about 225 pretty consistently on a good day where all the rest are limited. So, all right, any other questions? Yeah, yeah, Jay. Uh, you've raised a question that would pertain to R32 panels on a dramatically difficult um, roof to get in. Um, uh, is there any potential interest and logic to having just a pod of micro inverters? So if you've got 32 panels you, if, and the two first send pairs, you know, we have 16 micro inverters sitting in one place that we could shimmy up to on a ladder by the gutters? Yeah. Um... I mean, if you're anticipating them going bad, that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, I, I don't know. I've not ever seen anybody do such a thing, but you'd always obviously have to have some uh, some pigtails or proprietary pigtails of some sort going up there. Um, yeah, in theory, it would it would work, but it would be kind of cumbersome. I mean, you'd it it. I guess Enphase could come up with something like that because in their in their battery pack, if you open up the battery pack, there is a row of microinverters in there. That's how they do the inverter con, um, charging thing. Um, so so they have secondary microinverters in that battery pack instead of like one big string inverter. Um, so they could come up with a. Uh, think about it like a combiner box uh, or, or a junction box up there on the array where 
All your microinverters are co-located and wired together in a branch circuit. And all you have to do is just run pigtails in from your panels. And then from there, you would, um, you would then take your power to your AC disconnect um, or your combiner box, the end phase combiner box. So yeah, that'd be an interesting product. Go for it, Jay, go ahead and build it. It, it'd be a lot easier to install and a lot easier to manage, but then you've got another box up there, you know, somewhere. If, it, if you're trying to stick it under an, a rooftop array, I don't know where the room would be. Yeah, John, you had something? Uh, what is that bubble thing that you, tool that you use to find the shade of an area that went out in the parking lot? What's that thing called again? Yeah, Solar Pathfinder. Okay, that's it. Yep. Yeah, and we had suggested in the class that if somebody wants a solar pathfinder, the best thing I ever did uh, to get them was to go on eBay. And a lot of times people buy them brand new just to do an install, but they only have to do one install. So then they sell it and it costs 300 bucks new. And then they turn around and resell them after one usage. But I just bid a hundred bucks on each time one came up. And I'd, I'd usually miss it, somebody pay more, but two times I won the bid. And so I got two, two solar pathfinders just by being patient. I mean, one's as good as another. It doesn't really matter if you're not in a hurry. So buy them cheap. All right, plus, you know, the whole thing about that combiner box system, it'd be a whole lot easier to do midnight procurement with that. Yeah, you'd walk off with, with two dozen yeah. uh, microinverters yeah. just just with a couple of. Uh, so let me, he's got to yeah. let me know when he gets it put in. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay, but that's All an right. interesting product. I I could see there being a real market for that. You know, everything's going to plug and play. So imagine you could buy it as one unit, and now instead of having to install fifteen individual microinverters and all of the, the wire management and all of that stuff associated with it. Um, but you'd, you'd have an awful lot of pigtails, uh, you know, with the MC4s, um, you know, because you'd have to run those all the way to that combiner box from each panel to connect the panels to the microinverters. So there'd still be some wire management there. I found out that uh, the Pathfinder makes financial sense if you're the person on the roof doing the siding. To, so for me, I, I'm not going to go on the roof. Um, so all of a sudden, so I start finding that there are companies that will go up and do site evaluations for you, solar uh -huh. site evaluations in the Chicago area. And they only yeah. want 550 bucks to do that. So I go from there and what I come down to is I can do everything remote through Aurora Solar I can, and um, get to pitch and everything else and, and the site is already done. So, yeah, except that, that you're, relying, you're relying on the LiDAR um, imagery, which may or may not be up to date. That's, that's the only issue. With, with something from Aurora Solar. I agree with it. Even though that, that occurs, it's sort of minor. What is the worst part of Aurora in those places is I, I do the whole work up on it and find out that a year ago they tore down three trees. Yeah, yeah, that's the issue, the up-to-date thing. Um, or if there's, uh, you know, they built a building or they put in some overhead power wires or whatever. So it's really only as good as Google Earth is as far as the imagery that they rely upon. Um, so it's a, it's a good system. Speaking of Aurora Solar, there is a online free event. Let me grab some of that information. It's called Empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R 2021 from Aurora Solar. And it's taking place um, in June. June 8th and June 9th. So um, 
if you're interested, uh, go ahead and go do a Google search. You can you can sign up. They've got some nice keynote speakers, some some other speakers there. I went ahead and registered for it. it it's free. It's like their virtual. Um, you know, here's all the top execs from the solar industry giving what they think is going to happen. So, you know, do a search on it and, and sign up for it if you've got the time. Uh, it's not an all day kind of thing. In fact, uh, the sessions I signed up for, uh, there's one. Um, does that show me? I don't know if they have the times there, but but they were like, Seems to me one was in the evening and one was in the afternoon each day. Yeah, um, 9.30 a.m. for the welcome and keynote, 10 a.m. for another one, and then 1.30 for the other one. So not a not an all-day commitment. So, all right, uh, anything else you have, Bill, before we, you'll get our last word? Yeah, I just I just got an email from uh, Enphase. I have not been interacting with them. The email uh, says, I am reaching out to you to follow up on your interest in our legacy upgrade program. It appears you opted in for our option one microinverter upgrade earlier this year, but never heard back from you. Uh, this sounds like um, they want me to want money to for upgrade, whereas I can get free replacements because of the warranty. Any comments on that? Yeah. I, Sounds to I, me I, like uh, like an iPhone for life type deal. Yeah, I don't know. Or they might have been monitoring our discussion and they've just decided uh, it's a scammer who's coming after you there. for yeah. some money. But <laughs> I've never I've never heard of that thing. I've never been... I've never had anyone reach out to me for upgrading. I don't know why you would do it. Well, it's all about bottom line. And I will call her and uh, find out what it is. I, again, I know I can get uh, microinverters replaced because of the warranty uh, at, at no cost. Uh, and I don't yeah. know what the legacy upgrade program is, but I'll inquire. I'll let I you think, know next week. I think Tony's probably right. If you wanted to update, you know, get the latest and the greatest, but unlike an iPhone, who cares? As long as it's generating power, you know, right. um, you'd have to probably change your panels out to deal with the bigger inverters anyway. So mm -hmm. I don't see that as a big, big selling point. I could see it from their perspective because they, they're already warranting it, why not get you to pay for a brand new one so they never have to replace the old one. But. Right. Okay, well, we're after one, so let's call it a, call it a session. We'll talk on Tuesday next week. All right, All right take care.